good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's very nice to see so many old faces and friends. And today we have the great pleasure of being with uh, our different Todd Lawson, uh, who's Professor Emeritus of Islamic Thought at the University of Toronto. And Todd has taught courses and supervised graduate work in Quranic studies, Islamic mysticism, and Islamic philosophical theology. Uh, he's published widely on Quran uh, commentary, or Quran as literature, Sufism, and the Babi and the Baha'i traditions. Todd's interest in Islam is deeply connected to its gospel of the oneness of humanity, that has made and continues to make enduring contributions to our shared cultural and social ecology. Indeed, you can find an informative interview with Todd entitled The, Human the Unity of Humanity online in the Bashara magazine. His presentation today is going to explore the Joseph myth, retold as the most beautiful of all stories in the Quran. So we welcome Todd and his talk today titled The Transformative Power of Beauty. Joseph and the Myth of Reconciliation. We very much welcome Todd Lawson. Thanks everyone for, for joining, joining the, the group. Uh, at, uh, if there is no audience, there is no show after all. Okay. Uh, yes, well, the, the idea here is that we are interested in the unity of the human race. And we, uh, 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 all of us, Bashara and, uh, and me and the Baha'i community and many, many millions of people throughout the world. And it can be sometimes a dispiriting hope. But uh, if we read carefully the Surah of Joseph, uh, which the Quran claims uh, and tells us is the most beautiful of all stories, it doesn't restrict it. It says it's the most beautiful of all stories, not just the most beautiful story in the Quran, as David clearly pointed out. But I want to re-emphasize this. The Quran says that this is the most beautiful of all stories, and the, the language used is very deft, naturally. It's the Quran. What, what do we expect? And, and it introduces us to the idea of story and the idea of beauty uh, together. And the, the chief centerpiece of the of the joseph surah is precisely beauty there are no prophets or messengers mentioned there are no laws mentioned no no rules and regulations uh, the the action is done by human beings and by joseph of course is recognized by the islamic tradition and jacob and other prophets who are mentioned as prophets or messengers or both but the, these words do not occur in the story of Joseph. What we have is a drama or a, a dramatic, if you like, epic, which reflects, uh, it will be revealed by and by in the course of these comments, reflects the general epic story of humanity, which the Quran posits, a beginning in a time and place, beyond time and place, a birth into the world, a process of knowing the self and knowing the world and knowing others, and a return to the pristine, uh, blissful meeting from where it all began. So this is what I'm reading in the story of Joseph, and we will just go ahead and see how this can be done. Uh, we don't have to all agree, of course, but this is something that. Uh, that I'm sharing with you for your kind uh, consideration, patience, and input. I'm looking forward to the end of my words, which will go on to some length, I'm afraid, uh, so we can have uh, uh, a discussion about these issues and these questions. So, <laughs> hoping to, here we are. Now, I have to move that, that uh, strip of, of uh, people up there so I can see what it says. The, the beautiful faces of you, the people, are now blocking out the top of my uh, 
screen, so I can't really read it. It's not. So do you can you can minimize the strip or get rid of it completely? I should like to. Oh, I see. It's over here. Thank you. That's better. All right. So the story of Joseph is an enduring myth, as you know. It's 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 a, a part of the Abrahamic DNA, as you if you will. Uh, it is a. a it is, appears in all sorts of uh, circumstances and contexts from Broadway to Thomas Mann to the Hebrew Bible to the Quran and some people even see it in the in the ancient Egyptian uh, tales about the the brothers and uh, uh, who uh, resolve their conflicts and so on um, the Christian tradition sees Joseph as a type for the anti-type of Jesus. There are a number of very important overlaps between the story of Joseph and the gospel account of Jesus, and the Quran uh, esteems it very highly. So uh, J Joseph is one of a community of prophetic figures in, in the Quran whose story emerges as an epic and emblematic account of divine knowledge revealed to humanity. Centerpiece is said is uh, the idea of beauty and truth and the ability of beauty and truth to transform uh, barbarism into civilization or lead into gold or or matter into spirit, if you like. The Surah of Joseph is presented here as a renewable myth for our current collective life. And Naturally, part of the plight is me not being able to control this machine. Here we are. So, to begin with, uh, as Quran claims that we have revealed this, uh, in Surah 12, as the Surah of Joseph, as an Arabic Quran, as an Arabic recitation or information or opera, if you like, in order that you understand it. And as you all know, the word understand includes the idea of being controlled and formed by your understanding with this verb akal. You know, so uh, uh, this is understanding is what is translated by the translators, but there's also a deep implication, as Ibn Arabi points out, that, that this, this root for understanding has to do with forming character and controlling our uh, spasmodic desires and wishes and so on. So we relate to you, Muhammad is not mentioned, but I put it in there. We relate to you, Muhammad, the most beautiful of all stories. And before this revelation, you were one of those who did not know about it. So here is where the story of Joseph begins in the, in the fourth verse of Surah 12. And it begins like this. Recall the story of when little Joseph spoke to his father thus. Oh, Daddy dearest, believe it or not, I saw in my dream 11 stars and the sun and the moon, and I actually saw them bowing down to me. And this is where the drama begins. This, there is another act of bowing in the Surah of Joseph, which comes at the end of, of, the, of the epic. And uh, these two are intimately related. Uh, and the idea of bowing is very important, which we'll return to toward the end when we start talking about the covenant. Um, so summary Jacob instructs Joseph not to divulge his dream to his brothers envious brothers decide to kill him one speaks against this so Joseph is put in the well the passing caravan sends for water the water bearer discovers the handsome youth the caravan purchases Joseph from the brothers for 20 pieces of silver uh, sort of anticipating the 30 pieces in the in the gospel the brothers lie to Jacob a wolf ate J Joseph while we were playing the robe is daubed with false blood presented to Jacob who is skeptical suspects the worst Joseph is purchased by a prominent Egyptian couple known to history as Potiphar and Zuleika though their names are not mentioned in the Quran Potiphar the husband is referred to as Aziz and Zuleika is known as uh, in the story his wife so the man in egypt this is the quran now the man in egypt who bought him said to his wife 
make his stay among us honorable and noble. Maybe he will bring us much good, or we will adopt him as our son. Thus did we establish Joseph in that land so that we might teach him the true meaning, interpretation, the word is ta'wil, of events and the accounts of them. God is always in control of his life, even if most of humanity do not understand this. So these are a few repeating Quranic themes that we won't uh, uh, stop here to, to talk about. But every verse could be the topic of several books, it seems. The wife of the Egyptian, Joseph's new mother, conceives a powerful desire for this young Hebrew slave and seeks to seduce him. Joseph is tempted but resists. Scorned, Zuleika accuses Joseph of violation. The evidence is examined and all agree that Joseph was innocent of the charge. All agree. The scandal that the wealthy and noble lady wife of the Aziz, Potiphar, a powerful minister of the Pharaoh, has lost her heart to a mere slave, a Hebrew from Canaan at that, takes Egypt, at least aristocratic Egypt, by a storm. In order to exonerate herself, Zuleika invites the ladies of the neighborhood, of the posh neighborhood, and where they obviously live, uh, perhaps court of the court, to a banquet. As they are whispering amongst themselves about how sad it is that Zuleika has so disgraced herself, Zuleika calls for Joseph, the famous scene of the ladies being so dazzled and overwhelmed by Joseph's beauty that they cut their hands rather than the oranges they are peeling is now presented by the Quran. Oops. So here it is. So when they actually saw him, they immediately recognized his exceptional beauty and cut their hands instead of those oranges. <laughs> and they exclaimed, this is no mortal. This is none but a noble angel. Zuleika upbraids the lady saying, now you understand. Now you see what I have to deal with. And now if he refuses me, I will have him put in prison. Joseph continues to refuse Zuleika's advances. My husband deems it best if Joseph is put in prison for a while, even though everyone has already Acknowledge that he's absolutely innocent. So, so the key here is, for presently it occurred to the nobleman and his household, even after they had seen all the signs of Joseph's innocence, that they might as well imprison him for a time. Many implications here. Well, he's a Hebrew, he's not one of us. If he didn't attempt an attack on her, he might have done it anyway. So. Plus, he's causing a lot of difficulty. Let's just get him out of the way for a while, even though we know he's innocent, right? In prison, Joseph discovers his ability to interpret. He explains the dreams of his two fellow prisoners. Well, there's Joseph in the middle, flanked by two prisoners on the side. So one, in fact, who will be crucified, and the other will become the butler of the Pharaoh. Joseph asks, the one who will become the butler to mention his plight to Pharaoh when he is released. His fellow prisoner agrees and then immediately forgets to mention anything, of course. So Joseph languishes in prison. Now we cut away to the court of Pharaoh, which is uh, very key. Everything is key, but forgive me if I say this is very key because this is how I present it. If Pharaoh is troubled by his unusual and cryptic dreams of the fat cows devour, devoured by seven emaciated cows, the green and the withered corn, and so on. Pharaoh brings this dream to his ulama that are, are sitting around the court uh, waiting to interpret or answer any question that Pharaoh might have. He presents them the dream, and they are powerless to see anything in it. And so, of course, when this happens, when there's a lack of imagination and intelligence, they say it's nonsense. <laughs> Jumbled dreams, chaos. So we see here this seed of this idea of Joseph, who is the artist of the Islamic tradition, 
and the and and the vocation of the artist typically since time immemorial is to create order out of chaos we see him now coming in from the wings to do just that because he will at the request of pharaoh ultimately come to the court and interpret the, the so-called chaotic or impossibly uh, uh, meaningless dreams uh, to the pharaoh the pharaoh is deeply impressed and upon hearing the interpretation the tat wheel of these dreams establishes joseph in the land this is a theme throughout the the uh, the surah being established in the earth and it means being established with some authority with some sovereignty the word is mulk so um this is long uh, <clears throat> the brothers come to egypt after joseph has acquired this office perhaps something like a minister of agriculture or something like that he's very near the pharaoh extremely high position in society this wretched hebrew slave is transmuted from slave and servant to the household a victim of circumstance to one of the most powerful people in the land through his power of imagination and his gift to interpret which comes directly from god as it is repeatedly asserted in <coughs> in the surah so so the brothers come to egypt this, these jealous brothers come to egypt seeking grain because of a famine at home in canaan joseph recognizes them but they do not recognize joseph he gives them grain promises more but commands them to bring their other brother when they return joseph in order to encourage them secretly returns their trade goods to them so when they return home they beg jacob to send benjamin joseph's full brother uh, they're both children of rachel uh, jacob's favorite wife who is now uh, uh, deceased joker uh, jacob they beg jacob to send benjamin with them on their return trip uh, to encourage this they they discover that their their bartering goods have been returned secretly in their saddlebags as they look, uh, look how wonderful this this aziz they're now calling joseph the aziz in in egypt how he how generous and kind he is he's even returned our barter our bartering goods jacob is <clears throat> is thus reminded of their plot when they got rid of his beloved Joseph. So this, this theme, which we haven't stressed enough so far, uh, of the love between Joseph and Jacob is utterly central as well. How can many things be central? Well, God is a sphere whose center is everywhere, remember. So this is also central. Uh, Jacob first refuses, then he relents and allows Benjamin to go back with these dastardly brothers <coughs> to Egypt land. <clears throat> Excuse me. The brothers with Benjamin return to Joseph, whom they still do not recognize, referring to him only by the honorific Aziz, the same title of his adoptive father. So here we see a kind of role reversal that uh, will appear again at the end of the story. Uh, this gives emphasis to the to the dramatic uh, message narrative epic message that is being uh, sent to us this idea of father and son changing places husband of uh, the husband of Zuleika so he was formerly called Aziz Joseph divulges his identity to his younger brother Benjamin the brothers are sent away <clears throat> but Benjamin is kept back on false charges of theft the brothers plead for Benjamin's release knowing that Jacob will see this as a repeat of their betrayal with Joseph. Benjamin is the son of Rachel and Joseph, uh, uh, as is Joseph. They are, they are full brothers. Uh, we mentioned this already. When Jacob learns that the brothers left Benjamin in Egypt, he laments to God alone, sees this as a perfect 
repeat of the jealousy and envy of his other sons against these sons of Rachel, and is so overcome with grief at the loss of these two favorite sons that his he, he weeps so much that in such profusion that his tears wash away his sight. Only unbelievers despair of the kindness of God, he adds. Beautiful patience is mentioned a second time. So we have two words for beauty in this surah, and there's some other, other ones as well. But the, the first one, when we talk about the most beautiful story, is husn. And this one is um, uh, uh, jamil, uh, sub jamil, beautiful patience. So jo Jacob is engaged with his patience and the, uh, the, the beauty of his act and the beauty of Joseph are somehow uh, cross fertilizing with each other, circulating amongst themselves. Beauty really never leaves the screen in the surah of Joseph. The brothers return to Joseph and plead with him. He reveals himself. He forgives them for their betrayal and selling him into slavery and orders his garment to sent to Jacob when the brothers return to Canaan land and tells them to take his shirt, this famous robe of many colors which is one of the reasons the brothers were jealous of him to begin with because they these many colored robes are very expensive items in in uh, wretched canaan land which is a desert and uh, not a, a wealthy territory as is egypt so take this with you and 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 lay it on the eyes of my father that his sight might be restored he he, and then he says, and then come back down to Egypt with your entire family and live here in peace and safety. Now, this is a very beautiful <laughs> part of the Quran. As soon as the brothers cross the border between Egypt and Canaan land, of course, there is no border, but as soon as they, they cross into Canaan, there's another cinematic cutaway, and we see Jacob sitting up in bed and saying, I, I, I sense Joseph. And it's, it's uh, astounding uh, to him. And everyone else thinks that he is, uh, he's losing his mind, as the Quran tells us. The Quran is very wise. So the sons of Jacob went back to Egypt and to Joseph, uh, and, <clears throat> and to Joseph. Uh, they uh, and uh, when they come back to ask for more grain, uh, he said to them, "Do you remember what you did to Joseph and his brother when you were still unaware of right and wrong?" According to the translator, they explained, "Why is it indeed you who art Joseph?" This is the great recognition scene. He answered, "I am Joseph, and this is my brother. God has indeed been gracious unto us. Verily, if one is conscious of Him." And patient, again, beautiful patience, in adversity, behold, God does not fail to requite the doers of good. And you'll notice he snuck in another reference to beauty as here in the Musanin. The, the idea of husn is again evoked, as is the beauty of the patience. So the brother said, by God, most certainly has God raised thee high above us, and we were indeed but sinners. Then Joseph says the key uh, statement in the surah when, in which he forgives the brothers, forgives them for their treachery and their jealousy and their envy and their avarice and their betrayal. Uh, <clears throat> no reproach shall be uttered today against you. May God forgive you your sins, for he is the most merciful of the merciful. It is said in the Sirah, by the way, of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, that uh, after the conquest of Mecca, and when the Quraysh had been finally defeated by the Muslims and were expecting the very worst, uh, were somewhat surprised when the Prophet did not punish them all and slaughter them all as war 
Arab war usage apparently uh, permitted. And they asked him about this and he said, oh no, no I, I am doing what my brother Joseph did with his brothers. Uh, the, and he quoted this precise uh, Quranic verse. The whole surah, by the way, had been revealed in the late Meccan period. So, <clears throat> so now go and take this tunic or this robe or this shirt of mine, lay it over my father's face and he will recover his sight. So, and as soon as the caravan, which Jacob's sons were traveling, was on its way, their father said to the people, behold, were it not that you might consider me senile, I would say that I truly sense the breath or the fragrance of Joseph in the air. And they say, you are truly out of your mind. Then the bearer of good news, a word dear to the hearts of Bashara, the Bashir arrives with a shirt, places it on Jacob's eyes, his eyesight is restored. His sons beg for forgiveness and it is granted. They all arrive in Egypt and present themselves before Joseph. And he drew his parents close to him saying, enter Egypt, if God so will, you will be secure from all evil. Now here we have this <clears throat> verse 100. We have a, a reference to the original bowing down of the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, sort of a, a, a repetition uh, uh, type, if you like. So he raised his parents to the throne, and it's the, the word for throne here. There's no mistake, it's the Arsh of honor. And they all fell down before him, prostrating themselves in adoration. Thereupon Joseph said, oh my father, <clears throat> this is the real meaning of my dream of long ago, which my sustainer has made come true. And he was indeed good to me, when he freed me from prison, and when he brought you all unto me from the desert, after Satan had sown discord between me and my brothers. Verily my sustainer is, we all have to get, gather together to come up with the best translation for Latif, in whatever he wills. Verily he alone is all-knowing and truly wise. So this Latif, in this context has a very special resonance, I believe, with the ideas of beauty and with the idea of particularly narrative beauty and uh, uh, dramatic beauty. It's a, the, the word Latif, is, as, as we know, means subtle. It also means kind. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful divine attribute and name. As it happens, the root for Latif uh, ha, it enjoys the status of being the centermost word of the entire Quran in the Mus'af that we have now, the, the edition that we read now. It is the center word, uh, the center root, and ha, it has also to do with kindness. So my, verily my sustainer is subtle and knowledgeable and knows how the most delicate things work together and uh, so forth. Uh, we could spend ages thinking about and speaking about this word Latif. So, where are we now? How are we doing? I guess we're doing okay. So, here's the conclusion. And uh, uh, the, this is the official end, actually, of the Surah of Joseph. There's a prayer here at, at verse 101, a very beautiful prayer, but I won't read it now. And then there's this conclusion to the Surah, the story of Joseph. This account is of something that was beyond the reach of thy perception. This is the Quran speaking to Muhammad. Thy, here is Muhammad. We now reveal unto thee, for thou wert not with Joseph's brothers when they resolved upon what they were going to do and wove their schemes against him. No matter how strongly you desire it, prophet, and by, by association, the rest of us who are reading, most will not believe this revelation. This is a theme that is also repeated in this surah 
and throughout the Quran. Very beautiful, divine revelation. The poetry of the Arabic is, is overwhelmingly glorious and beautiful. And the laws are beauty. It's all about the uh, movement from savagery to civilization in a, in a real sense. But most of humanity, no matter how much we desire, will not believe it. It is God's reminder, dhikr, to all humanity. The word reminder is important. We'll encounter it in a few minutes. But how many signs are there that most humans pass by without seeing. Most do not even believe in God, but ascribe divine powers to others. They feel invulnerable or beyond divine punishment somehow. So Muhammad is taught to say, this is my way, based on conscious insight, accessible to reason. I am calling you all to God. I am those who follow me. Even before thy time, we never sent as our apostles any but mortal men whom we inspired, whom we always chose from among the people of the very communities to whom communities to whom the message was to be brought. Have then they who reject the divine writ never journeyed about the earth and beheld what happened in the end to those who denied the truth, who lived before them? And do they not know that to those who are conscious of God, the life in the hereafter is indeed better than this world. Will they not then use their reason? All the earlier apostles had to suffer persecution. But at last, when those apostles had lost all hope and saw themselves branded as liars, our succor attained to them, whereupon everyone whom we willed was saved, and the deniers of the truth were destroyed, for never can our punishment be averted from people who are lost in sin. Indeed, this is the last verse. Indeed, in the stories of these men, there is a lesson for those who are endowed with insight. As for this revelation, this is, this is also very uh, poignant. It could not possibly be a discourse invented, a, a, a mere fiction, shall we say. Nay, indeed, it is divine writ confirming the truth of whatever there still remains of earlier revelations, clearly spelling out everything and offering guidance and grace unto people who will believe. Okay? So that is now the end of the entire surah. Uh, thank you for your patience while we uh, went through that rather quickly. I hope it wasn't uh, uh, too rapid. Um, excuse me. I seem to have something in my throat. So, what I would like to do now is uh, show you what I see as a, a, a very deep connection between this surah and another <laughs> centerpiece of the Quran, namely the teaching about the covenant and the day of the covenant, which is most. Uh, perfectly articulated in Surah 7, verses 172 and 173. But uh, before we go there, I would just like to introduce you to the general drift. And uh, the general drift seems to me is captured by Eliot, although I'm sure he was not an avid reader of the Quran. But uh, this beautiful thing from Little Gidding, these four famous lines. Uh, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. I think this speaks to the idea of the covenant as uh, taught in the Quran. And so now let us look at, we'll leave T.S. Eliot and go to the Quran. If I can make this thing work. Okay, here we are. So this is the famous verse that I mentioned earlier. And it, uh, it is key. I mean, it's, it, it, this verse inhabits Islamic discourse at a very deep level. Scholars, artists, literateurs, legal minds, uh, historians, all 
uh, are energized and inspired by this verse. This verse represents the beginning, just as Genesis represents the day of creation, the days of creation in the Hebrew Bible represent the beginning of time in a sense for, for the biblical conception of things, uh, creation out of chaos and so on. Islam begins in a time and place where chaos is not on the radar at all. It's an, uh, it could not be more opposite. It begins in a place when all humanity, everyone who would ever live, uh, henceforth, zillions of human beings are summoned in this magisterial gesture by God. And this is, a, uh, the, this is the logic of myth, obviously, which we esteem possibly the most valuable of all logics. And all of these human beings who will eventually be born and live and, and sojourn through the mortal coil, as it were, they were all originally brought together in this blissful meeting of ecstasy and given this question by their Lord, thy Lord, drew forth from the children of Adam. This children of Adam is a synonym in the Quran for humanity, all humanity. Drew forth from the children of humanity from their loins, their descendants. That means all of their descendants. And made them testify concerning themselves, saying, am I not your Lord? The word Lord here, Reb, is actually a word that means nurture, cherish, sustain, educate. It's the basis for the Hebrew word rabbi, which means teacher. Am I not your Lord? And all of those zillions of eventual humans <laughs> answered with this very important Quranic word, bala. Yea, to th do this do we absolutely testify. This is an intensive uh, affirmative uh, word. And then the Quran, as in a typical fashion, explains why this, this exchange took place in the way that it's described here. We did this, lest you would say on the day of Kiyama, which I'm leaving untranslated for the moment, of this we were never mind. We didn't know we had to obey and behave ourselves and treat each other uh, uh, kindly and and uh, carry ourselves in a civilized fashion. We had no idea of this. Or lest you should say, our fathers before us may have taken false gods, but we are their descendants after them. Wilt thou then destroy us because of the de deeds of men who were futile? They're, this is mubtilun. That's the, that's the polar opposite of the idea of hak. Batil and Hak is, is encapsulated here. So will you destroy us because of the deeds of men? We, it's not our fault. Our parents made us do it. This myth of the original day of the covenant cancels out all of those kinds of excuses. But it also does a great deal more. It is this day of the myth. Oh, excuse me. Where I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> all right. So, <clears throat> so first of all, this covenant, Day of the Covenant, provides one of the two poles of the epic of humanity that I was speaking about earlier. This is the beginning. This is the beginning, which is not really mentioned in the Quran until about a third of the way through it. And that's the way all decent epics function. It never automatically shows you where things begin. Uh, people thought this would be too insulting the intelligence of the reader. So they would, everyone knows how it began, but we begin in medias race, as it were, in the middle of the action. And this is how the Quran begins. But this is the actual beginning. This is equivalent to, to Helen being born out of the egg, right? The, so. And the end is this day of Qiyamah, this day of rising 
sometimes resurrection, sometimes referred to as judgment day. But note that Qiyama comes from the same, same root, Arabic root, as the word for people or nation, Qaum. So it's kind of a day of being a real human being. Uh, or, or a day of uh, of uh, of uh, standing for what what is right and what we must do as humans to fulfill our obligation to life. And why life comes in because piyama is also derived from this very important uh, Quranic word. I don't know how I could say very important. All the words are important. This word hayum, which is a, also a derivative of piyama and kama. And Qayyum means self-subsisting. So that this, this idea of self-subsisting uh, divinity uh, infused rising to your destiny is implied in this word Qiyama. Uh, and this is, the, this is the end of the Quranic epic. This is the equivalent to Eliot's to know the place for the first time, right? Uh, so, so the uh, but between the time of the day of the covenant, which occurs in a, in a in a mythic place before time and space, before creation, until the time of Piyama, which is also somehow implicated in his history, as it were, plain old history, which we all have to suffer. Uh, there is a life is uh, is goes on apace in the sublunar realm, in the earthly existence. And uh, a clue to the importance of this is, is found in the way in which the word Qayyum, which I don't have it written here, but that's a, it, it's, it occurs three times in the Quran. It always comes accompanied by the word Al-Hay, the living. So it refers to God as the self-subsisting and the living. So life and self-subsistence standing are associated uh, with each other in this Quranic turn. So in between this time, we have the uh, uh, somewhat uh, dispiriting experience of people forgetting who they really are, forgetting this primordial, absolute unity and peace and harmony, because in a sense, the, the scenario here on the Day of the Covenant, yes, the Lord is important, but he emerges as something of an extra in the face of all of this humanity being gathered in one place and in peace. Nothing could be more foreign to the audience of the Quran than this somewhat, you know, in the, in the midst of the, what is experienced in the Nile to Oxus region during this late antique moment in human history as a chaos of religions, this would be absolutely a revelation to people who thought there was a time when we all agreed together in the presence of the Lord. See, so it's a very powerful image. So that is the beginning of our epic, and the end is when we actually own this and take it on. But in the meantime, what happens is that we forget about that original day of unity and, and, and harmony and ecstasy in being in the presence of God. We forget this. And this is, explains why in the Quran, this word to remember occurs 292 times in various forms. So it is, a, a, and this is what, causes Ibn Arabi and uh, Ibn Abbas and others to say that the word for humanity, nas or insan, doesn't come from unsi, uh, the, the more etymolo etymologically sound explanation. This is uh, for, for the derivation of the word nas and insa, but that comes from the word for forgetfulness, nasiya. That, that, uh, and so the, while Islam doesn't posit original sin at all, in fact, the original meeting is the opposite of sin. It's one of joy and gladness in the presence of the Lord with all human beings. It does allow as to how us humanoids forget from time to time. And this is where 
the word for humanity comes from. We need to be reminded of that day and of our vocation and of our destiny and of our uh, the debt that we owe each other and, if you can speak in these terms, uh, our Lord. Thus the Quran, another of whose title is in fact the remembrance of the ceaselessly calls upon humans to recall that primordial day. Okay, and this happens also to be the scene of Ibn Arabi's Ayyam uh, Thabita. This is, uh, this is, uh, you can think of all of that humanity as the zillions of separate Ayyam that are there in the presence of the Lord. Primordial day of the covenant and return to that moment of universal unity and to know it for the first time. Okay, next, what's next? Where are we? Yes. Okay, so uh, there is another adjunct to Yama, and it's the idea of return. And it's mentioned many, many times in the Quran, but I think this is generally understood. Uh, we don't need to spend uh, a, a lot of time with this. So, uh, the following parallels are what I see, and there are undoubtedly more, and this is where I hope to get some feedback from, from all of us here today, is that the bowing of the heavenly bodies to Joseph may be seen as an allusion to the verbal bow, humanity's ascent to the uttering of this intensive form, bala. Uh, in fact, in, in, in fiqh, uh, the, the sujood, <coughs> the prostration, is glossed as a dramatization of uh, uttering this affirmation. So it's very interesting that the bowing is a kind of saying bala in, in, in the course of one's prayers and, and at any other time. Uh, <clears throat> the fuqaha, the, the uh, theologians and so on, had difficulty with uh, two instances of bowing in, in the Quran. One was the angels bowing uh, before Adam and the other are the, is the stars bowing uh, to uh, to Joseph and they went through all sorts of uh, contortions to try to understand it. <coughs> uh, uh, this is just as an aside, but I think that its resolution comes if we think about this this surah in conjunction with the drama of the day of the covenant. Instead of bala, there is this bow. Now. The, what about these uh, the heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon and the stars and so on? In uh, that time and place, this was particularly important because these were the symbols of beauty in the world. Nothing was more beautiful. All of those of you who have been in the desert at night, nothing is more, this is why they call Layla, Layla. Nothing is more beautiful at night than these stars. And we see these paragons of beauty actually bowing down to Joseph's beauty, right? Of whom the prophet said, God created beauty in a hundred parts and assigned to Joseph 99. This helps us understand. Joseph was simply unbelievably beautiful. And the stars and the sun and the moon all know this. Not only are the stars and sun and moon symbols of beauty, but they are also integers or, if you like, uh, symbols or signs of knowledge. They are interpreted by astrologers and astronomers and observers for uh, all kinds of reasons. So they're symbols of truth and beauty together. And they are all bowing down to Joseph. Humanity's ascent, etc. Such bowing is mirrored again at the end of the story with the return, which in this instance is given a twist. It is not the hero, Joseph, who returns to his people, but it is the people who return to Joseph. That is, they travel to him. It opens up new horizons. Joseph's family, a symbol of the pluralism accounted for both at the day of the covenant and throughout the Quran. Uh, if, you read, if you read the Quran just for an eye to the uh, human variety that it mentions, it becomes a very, very, very interesting book for our time. And for that matter, uh, in Ibn Arabi's work. The surah is full of references to covenant or contract or agreement 
either positive or negative. The beauty of Joseph is understood as a reflection or embodiment of divine beauty. So this is a, when the family is bowing down. Incidentally, the Arabic is a little ambiguous there. So it, it's almost as if in, in verse 100, when Joseph, when the family bow, is, is elevated to the throne, the Arsh, it's not too sure, not too clear who we're all bowing down to. The, the pronoun is, is not specifically divine. They could be bowing down to the Arsh, to the throne of God. Which, of course, in uh, in amongst the Bashar people and the Sufis and the mystics, the throne of God is consciousness, obviously, and so they they are bowing down to to this rather than directly to Joseph. But even if they are bowing down to Joseph, Joseph is a manifestation of divine beauty, unlike any other one that had ever lived. So, also the father-son relationship is uh, has an oblique reference. Uh, to the fatherly question on the day of alas. Uh, note that in Surah 7, 172, the questioner is called our Lord and not Allah. This is a this is a, an important difference. So the, the Rabb is a kind of fatherly uh, position, uh, one who looks after the students or the children and asks these kids in his presence to to know what is what, what is real, and uh, do you recognize me or do you not? And they all gladly, in the same perhaps spirit, Joseph telling his father about his dream, oh, daddy, absolutely, yes, we are yours. So then we have the, the implied business in the day of the covenant about separation from that beautiful day when we were all together in harmony and peace in the presence of the Lord. We are taken away from that, right? Here in, in real life, as it were. Ha ha, real life. So separation and exile, key elements in any decent epic. And then, then in the process of exile, there's this idea of remembrance. Joseph and Jacob remembering each other throughout all of these terrible trials and tribulations that Joseph endured in his uh, ordeal as a result of being sent down the river, if you like, by his brothers. And patience, uh, implied in the exile from the day of the covenant. The return of Joseph's family, a symbol of the return, the general Islamic or Quranic return, and attaining the presence of their Lord. Thus this, whoops. <laughs> okay. Thus, the story of Joseph is not only the most beautiful of all stories, it is also beautifully wrought. It's a glad tidings for us here in the sublunar realm. Order out of chaos. And then, but within, in, the, in the story that's told by the Quran, we begin with order and harmony. And it is the human beings who create chaos. And then the divine messengers give the information that will allow them to restore the order. So it's a little bit different. But nonetheless, both motifs or mo both themes are, are quite clear in the so story of Joseph and in the myth of the Day of the Covenant. And glad tidings, of course, is nothing else but uh, uh, the word Bashar. And this root occurs three times in the, in the Surah of Joseph, as you all know. When the water bearer comes to get water in the well, the first thing he says is, yeah, Bushra. There's a, oh, what luck, uh, what, what a happy day. There's this young, strong, beautiful young man that we can get a lot of money for down in Egypt. And then there's a, in a slightly different tonality that's a re reference to the Basha, uh, the sort of human, human uh, condition, shall we say. And then finally, the Bashir who brings the shirt to Joseph, to Jacob at the end of the story. So through it all, this order is established through the act of the imagination. As you know, Ibn Arabi in the Fusus deems Joseph to be the manifestation of imagination. And as you know, uh, we all know, uh, Ibn Arabi, posits that imagination is the ontic 
ground of all existence or being. So this that Joseph is identified with this is also particularly uh, important, especially for those people who are uh, uh, lovers of the work of uh, Ibn Arabi. So interpretation is what will save us. Imagination will save us out of all of our trials and tribulations, persecutions, imprisonments. It is the imagination that will uh, cause us to live. Now, let's see. Can we actually say, ah, and as our friend T.S. Eliot said, a little getting, a little closer to the end, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. This is a beautiful uh, 16th century miniature of the reunion of Jacob and Joseph. And uh, I don't see any rose, but I suppose we could stretch it and say the fire and the lily and the fire and the tulips are one. But the fire of Joseph, the fire of their love and the Joseph and Jacob are certainly one here. And the tongues of flames are enfolded into the crown knot of fire and the fire and the rose are one. Thank you very much, everyone, for your kind patience.